Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Orange Audubon Society's December 22, 2022 program. Um, and it is about the Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. And I want to mention that we have a field trip to the preserve April 15th at 8 a.m. It's one of the limited edition field trips. And for reservations, you contact Kathy at wrigglingkathy at gmail.com. All right, I am going to add um, our speaker, Katie Welch, to the stream. Welcome, Katie. Thank, Thank you so much you. for being here. Um, I'll just quickly give a few facts about Katie, that she um, grew up in Jupiter, Florida, and went to FAU, studied biology. And uh, after her getting her degree, she uh, did sparrow surveys out at this Kissimmee Prairie Preserve, and at that point fell in love with it, and came here as a biologist in 2019. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell you all the rest, so I will turn this over to her. All right. Well, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate you having me. Um, and I'm glad I get to talk a little bit more about, you know, what I love, um, which is the prairie. Um, I've been here since 2019 as the biologist, so three and a half years. But if you consider my sparrow season in 2012, um, I've been here for a little while, uh, know a little bit about it, um, and really, really passionate about it. Um, i biased, of course, but I think it is the best Florida State Park. Um, it is a truly unique gem. Uh, so happy to talk with you guys today about our birds. Okay, thank you. So, um, let's see. We are going to this, this one. There you go. Uh, we all set up. Cool. All right, so yeah, we'll dive right into it. I'm gonna talk obviously a lot about our breeding birds, our specialty birds that we have here with the background and some ecology of the prairie, um, as well as a little background on myself. Um, let's see, there we go. So like Deborah said, thank you for that intro. I have done a lot of different fun things, um, working, uh, with UGA as a master's student on urban white ibis populations, which is the photo on the left. Um, and then after I graduated with my master's degree, I got to do a really fun uh, Kenya epidemiology project looking at Newcastle disease virus in backyard chicken flocks and how they interact with uh, wild birds and that sort of pathogen transmission. And that was an amazing experience, you know, across that country, looking at amazing different bird species. And then, of course, I just naturally came back to Florida um, after being at UGA for a little while. And, of course, spending more time with these little brown jobs, <laughs> uh, these Florida grasshopper sparrows, which uh, are just such an amazing, cool bird. So we'll definitely talk about those guys later. So Kissimmee Prairie Preserve State Park is 58,000 acres. It is the second largest state park in the Florida park system. It is the largest grassland east of the Mississippi River, which surprises people because when you think of Florida and our ecosystems, grasslands don't always come to your mind first. Um, but in central part of uh, southern peninsular Florida, uh, Florida dry prairie is for sure a big component of the landscape or was. We have lost over 90% of Florida dry prairie uh, since the 1900s. We've obviously, it's an easy ecosystem to convert into uh, agriculture development. There's no trees. There's not much that has to be done to convert into anything else. So just like the story of many other grasslands, it is in decline. Um, and we have the largest remaining extent of Florida dry prairie, which is pretty incredible that we get to conserve and study this beautiful landscape. So the landscape itself is defined by a, as a grassland by herbaceous species and saw palmetto. But there's also a mosaic of depression and basin marshes, as well as a couple different types of hammocks. There is also um, sluice systems that flow towards the west into the Kissimmee River. So we have a lot of diversity in habitats across this giant piece of land. So this is a map, just a management zone map. It may not be a useful hiking map, but just gives you a sense of how large the property is. Um, that Kissimmee River boundary on our western edge and this little Nevada shaped 
Polygon in the southwest corner um, is our new acquisition. This is Corgan Ranch that we closed on in December of 2021. Um, and a new part of the preserve, about 4,000 more acres. And we're still working on public access and all of that. But it's a cool new addition into Florida Dry Prairie Conservation and the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So we're happy to have a new piece of property that we get to conserve. This map indicates all the different colors of the habitats on the prairie. So greens and dark greens are going to be your dry prairie and your wet prairie. Any shades of blue, of course, are going to be water or wetlands, including that uh, river floodplain on the western side in that really light blue shade. And we've got some scrubby flatwoods, which is that rusty color. We've got some agriculture up in the northeast corner. That's mostly cattle lease, and that is semi-improved pasture. Um, and we've got some old historic tomato fields and crop blends that have been restored to some extent, but still register as somewhat agriculture because they are disturbed. But as you can see here, really diverse um, property and uh, lots of options for birds. This is a photograph of Florida Dry Prairie, pretty classic scene in the summertime. We got these rain clouds, these storm clouds moving over the prairie. And the prairie is defined again with herbaceous species and saw palmetto. The areas that are dominated by saw palmetto are the true dry prairie. They're slightly higher and drier than the grass dominated areas, which we consider wet prairie. And there's a lot more um, herbaceous and forb plants in that area. This ecosystem is maintained at this height through a series of drought fire and floods. So it is an interesting ecosystem uh, maintenance. So coming out of the winter months is our driest months of the year. We go into spring and summer where we get these afternoon thunderstorms with lightning. And those lightning strikes hit the ground, hit the prairie that are probably pretty dry and crispy. And those fuels ignite and create fire that would move across this landscape in in many ways, in a very beautiful mosaic pattern, hopefully. Um, and it's a part of the natural ecosystem is to have these fires burn the top off of the plants. Um, and then of course, with those fire or those lightning strikes is rain, right? So the next stage of the prairie is being flooded. So even in this area of dry prairie, there may be several inches of water on the ground. Um, and that's a natural part of keeping all of this plant life at a very short, two to three, maybe four feet in height. And it's a really cool part of this ecosystem where we don't really have trees, right? This is very similar to some of the sand hills and longleaf pine flatwoods um, as far as plant life, but there are no trees, there's no pine. So it's maintained through two to three years of these fires and annual flooding, keeping all these plants really short. And actually means all the biomass of these plants is underground. So if you were to ever do a cross section of a grassland, all of the root base is actually the main part of the biomass of these plants. The prairie is also depicted in a land remembered. And if this is a book you've ever read and you've ever gone through some of that imagery that Patrick Smith has written, um, it's all about the cracker settlers that came and settled in the Kissimmee River Valley, um, in the Kissimmee Prairie. So if you've ever read that book, now you've got an image to go with it. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's great Florida history um, and ecology. There's actually quite a bit in there that's pretty significant and cool. So these are just some of those other habitats, those hammocks. Hammock is the seminal word for shady place. And so this is a place where obviously trees grow, southern live oaks, cabbage palms, and of course, these edges are where a lot of great migratory songbirds end up throughout the year. Our wetlands, starting on the left, is this is a dry season photo of our gum slough dominated by gum trees and maple trees. Um, this slough flows into the Kissimmee River, which is the middle photo. Um, and on the right is a depression marsh, a pretty typical depression marsh dominated by pickerel weed. Now time to talk about the birds. So since 2002, we've been documenting what species that have been detected here, not only through staff uh, sightings, but any sort of uh, documentable 
visitor sightings, eBird reports, all that good stuff. Um, and you can see on the graph during the months of March, April, May uh, is our best time of year uh, for birds, at least diversity wise. Um, we see up to 159 birds that have been detected at Kissimmee Prairie during the spring months. Obviously fall migration, which is that second right hump um, is another really great time. June, July obviously drops off quite a bit, but that's about the breeding season when we've got some really cool species that spend all of their time here and probably the majority of what I'm gonna talk about today. But I can't go on without talking about some of the really cool stuff we have seen here. Um, some of our rarities only detected once um, or maybe just a couple of times during the hurricanes. Obviously these big storms can blow all sorts of fun uh, seabirds in. Uh, we've had common terns, sooty terns, Jaeger, uh, magnificent frigate birds in 2022. That actually came from Hurricane Ian, which is the first time we had frigate birds in, um, in the prairie, which was a pretty cool sighting, um, as well as additional fall rarities. So, of course, we've got lots of diversity of habitats, so we can have really cool uh, shorebirds, flycatchers. You know, we've detected yellow-breasted chats here, lark sparrows, Philadelphia vireos. There's all sorts of possibilities of seeing really cool birds here. Uh, we're just such a big property that sometimes you gotta work for it. <laughs> um, but sometimes they happen right off the park road, so you never know. Uh, spring rarities, we have of course bird uh, sparrows that come and overwinter here, um, some of our migratory sparrows. And it seems to be that in the spring is when we start seeing them. They, I'm sure the males start kind of perching up. They're not necessarily breeding or on territory, but they're probably getting ready. So I think they become a little bit more visible in the spring months. So clay colored sparrows, lacan sparrows, henlow sparrows, all those guys we, we typically see. And then of course, neotropical migrants, blue wing warbler, um, and of course, again, more uh, migratory shorebirds or uh, wetland birds, we, we see a fair amount of. Like I said, I wanted to go through some of our highlight birds, birds that, you know, people when they come out here are surprised to see just right out in the open or so many of them. And some of that has to do with our management style and technique. We are a preserve state park, so none of, um, we have no hunting at all. So some birds like our wild turkey, they don't really have a crazy fear of humans. They seem indifferent to our presence. So sometimes you walk out and there's a whole flock of turkeys. Um, sometimes you've got these males strutting around and the Osceola subspecies of tur wild turkey are just striking. When you see them in the sun and they've got their feathers all fluffed up, they're just really beautiful birds. So people love to see our turkeys. They're one of the favorites to see around the campground um, when you can just kind of walk around and walk right by some white-tailed deer and some wild turkeys. It's just a really cool experience for a lot of our visitors. Northern bobwhites also benefit for, uh, from frequent fire and prairie management. And this is definitely one of the cool birds that we see all the time. You hear them doing their typical bob white call. Um, and again, something that people don't normally experience and when they're out here and they hear it, it's just a really exciting, really cool thing for people to experience. Additional birds that love the prairie um, and on a different kind of spectrum. So on the drier spectrum of the prairie, we've got eastern towhees, kind of in that scrubbier prairie. And then our common yellow throats that end up more on that wet prairie side. We also have an abundance of eastern meadowlarks and Bachman sparrows. These are birds that are declining all over the United States. Again, grasslands are one of those that are easily converted. They are the most uh, commonly converted uh, ecosystem to development, agriculture, whatever. So we're seeing a decline in lots of grassland species. We're seeing a decline in a lot of insects and these birds are affected directly by all of that, but not at Kissimmee Prairie because we've got over 54,000 acres of prairie for them to utilize. Um, well, I guess not all of that's exactly prairie, but we've got a lot. So it's really cool to come here and just be able to see Bachmans, to hear meadowlarks every morning, just a really cool thing. So a species that we have breeding here, um, probably more common at other places, uh, mostly because we just don't have that many 
pine tree stands. We are a grassland for <laughs> what it's worth. Um, we do have a couple areas of pine trees and the bald eagles have found the perfect spot, the perfect tree. And since 2018, we've been monitoring them. Um, and one year they had two successful fledges. That was in 2021. Every year they've done at least one. Um, so it's a really cool thing that we monitor. We have our Eagle Watch uh, volunteer, Jamie, she comes out, she checks on these guys every few weeks and uh, yeah, she took these great pictures. She also checks on our Crested Caracara. Now these birds are just classic prairie raptors. Um, we probably have some of the most photographed Caracara um, around because they like to sit, you know, perch pretty close to where the park road is. Um, they're usually pretty open to being around people. They don't really have too much shyness except for during like early breeding season and nesting. Um, but outside of that, they seem to be pretty charismatic and they're always on the park road scavenging any sort of roadkill. Um, but they do hunt on their own. So they are falcons. They're known to be scavengers, but they will hunt. They spend a fair amount of time on the ground. Um, and they're really cool. I mean, when we do prescribe fires, these guys come in, they're always looking for uh, any unfortunate prey items that may have gotten caught up in the fire. I always joke, it's like they're looking for their little barbecue mouse snack. Um, but they're, when you, when you do a prescribed fire, you see them in big numbers all together coming to look for food in the burn unit. So one of my favorites for sure to see out on the prairie. A bird we documented um, for the first time breeding in the park this year um, is a short-tailed hawk. So these guys common in South Florida to some, well, I wouldn't say common, but uh, you can see them in South Florida. We do see a lot more of the dark morphs in Florida than we do the light morphs, which is a little backwards for most uh, birds of prey, where the light morph is the more common morph. Um, but these guys really hard to find their nest. They're very secretive nesters. Um, I never actually located the specific nest tree, but I checked on these guys a few times. They had this fledgling, which is the picture on the left. He's a little speckly. Um, and oh, uh, just like a really cool documentation. We've seen them every year. We always know, like kind of suspected, but we actually confirmed it this year that they had an offspring. Um, and it was a really cool detection for us. This is out by the Kissimmee River. It seems that they associate with um, like swamps and, and, and more uh, wet areas. So despite these being in a pine tree, but if you were to look at the, the trees behind them, it's all uh, maples and tupelos back there. So really cool detection. Whitetail kites, another one that people come from all over to Kissimmee Prairie to see. Um, we see pretty reliable uh, numbers year to year. Um, we have some areas that they're pretty reliable at and they come back to, um, but they do move some. Anywhere from two to six nesting pairs each year. We had only a couple this year, but last year we had six nesting pairs. Um, so kind of a um, variety of how many we'll see and where exactly you'll see them, but They've nested right off of the park road before. This individual was, uh, the photos captured by our primitive campground on our prairie loop trail. Um, and that seems to be a pretty reliable spot for them year after year. So I do recommend hiking our five mile prairie loop if you wanna go see white tail kites. Um, and this is about the time of year I expect to see them more frequently. We have documented them in almost every month of the year. So I consider them loose residents, but there's definitely the time between you know, January and May that we see them uh, most frequently. Swallowtail kites, uh, a favorite for many, uh, stunning aerial um, acrobatics uh, of many uh, ecosystems. I, I guess they associate a lot with wetlands um, and they we see them a lot with our wet prairies and our wetlands and they seem to nest pretty close to wetlands as well. We can have anywhere from two to five um, pairs of these, again, kind of associating closer to the river and any of our more wet areas. But there's definitely a time of year where 
once they're done nesting, they start staging near the Kissimmee River to move south. Not nearly in as big numbers as they do like in fish eating creeks, those really big staging flocks, but we do start seeing them kind of stage together before they move a little bit south. So really stunning birds. Burrowing owls are another one that people always um, are surprised to see a few of, and they're always looking for when they come to Kissimmee Prairie. I recommend for these guys to drive the park road at night and um, or pre-dawn and look for these guys in the road because they do exist pretty commonly in the prairie. It's just they are hiding behind layers and layers of salt palmetto and grass that you're never going to see them. They rarely perch up very high. Um, they don't fly very often. So seeing them in the prairie is hard. Um, I would say that if we have done a prescribed fire, it's a great opportunity to scan the landscape when it's charred. Um, you will see burrows a lot more obviously, and these birds will sit right at the top of their burrows, maybe a couple of little perch points, and they become a lot more visible right after a prescribed fire. But we do have a pretty healthy population of burrowing owls at Kissimmee Prairie. Of course, we have barred owls. I would be doing an injustice to my owl neighbors behind my house if I didn't include them, even though they are pretty common um, across other areas, not just Kissimmee Prairie, but they are just super cute when they're owlets, and I just had to include them in my presentation. We do have um, barn owls as well at the prairie. Um, occasionally, we get screech owls, but definitely not as often, and because of our lack of trees, um, or at least pine trees, we don't see great horned owls really at all. There have been detections of short-eared owls um, here, uh, the Caribbean race, and so definitely lots of cool owls here um, throughout the year. More nocturnal fun creatures, so common nighthawks, they are common, we do see them a lot. They are more aerial acrobats that eat insects on the fly very distinctive white patches on their wings, um, very distinctive calls. And, you know, most people get to experience them in this way, but nighthawks are one of my favorite prairie birds because they're my favorite nests to find. Um, and these nests are not really nests. They just kind of place eggs on the ground very much like a shorebird would, um, but they're very cryptic in color, those eggs, as well as once the birds are on the ground, you can see how their plumage just blends in with uh, the, the ground uh, with that female on the left guarding her two eggs. And then of course those eggs eventually hatch into some really cute, fluffy, very well camouflaged uh, baby nighthawks. So some of my favorite birds to come across in the prairie, usually when you disturb their nest or get too close, they will dive bomb you um, and boom you and it's an experience all in and of itself. <laughs> So definitely somebody I had to highlight today. Of course, when talking about Kissimmee Prairie, you have to talk about the unfortunate extinct species that used to inhabit this area. And that is the Carolina parakeet. It is one of the most familiar and lively birds from North America. It was our only native parrot and it was actually adapted to cold weather. Um, it, the whole range included Eastern and Midwestern states. Um, and they associated mostly with bottomland forests or swamps and fed largely on plant materials. As a parrot, of course, they were social and they were very loud, um, which was maybe one of the reasons why they were uh, maybe distasteful to some folks because they were loud. Um, and of course, Audubon, one of his greatest paintings, in my opinion, um, and of course his description, I have seen branches of trees as completely covered by them as they could possibly be. Um, such a beautiful striking bird. And of course, one of the reasons why they were driven to extinction was being shot at for their plumage, as well as the fact that they were crop pests. So they come in and devastate crops and farmers, of course, don't appreciate that. And one of the unfortunate things is being a social parrot it was vulnerable to shooting because it had a tendency to remain within gun range after fire, evidently responding to the distress of fallen comrades. So 
they'd shoot one and the whole family would come in and then the farmer would be able to shoot all of them. <coughs> so a very unfortunate behavioral thing that drove them, drove them to extinction even faster uh, because they were shot pretty much all at once when they were able to. And of course, habitat loss is another huge part of that. Um, like many endangered and extinct species, habitat loss, losing cavity trees, um, diseases, being captured for pet trade, just so many different reasons. One of the other things is egg collection. And this is an interesting story of Charles Doe, who was a uh, uh, one of the curators for the Museum of Bird and Eggs at UF. Um, some of the writings from Donald Nicholson didn't have many nice things to say about Doe. Um, saying he was selfish and inconsiderate. Um, so that it's not a great thing to have for someone who collects eggs from the wilds. And of course, for Carolina parakeets in such disrepair as they were in 1927, he had been documented collecting uh, parakeet eggs from a prairie hammock 20 miles from Bassinger Okeechobee, which is basically describing a hammock in Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. So those eggs that are pictured up there are very likely some of the last eggs um, collected for Florida, I mean, uh, for Carolina parakeets and uh, a really unfortunate part of their decline. And to talk about the parakeet, it's important for me to highlight the Lost Bird Project. Um, you can check this project out on lostbird.org. It is an artist's um, effort to memorialize extinct birds across um, North America. And his idea was that he didn't want another extinction to happen, which was basically us forgetting about them. So him memorializing them, he made these beautiful statues, these beautiful sculptures, and decided to place them in places that were ecologically significant for each species. <clears throat> so if you were to go to lostbird.org, there is a really great short film about these original five statues, um, the Labrador duck, the passenger pigeon, the great auk, the heath hen, and of course the Carolina parakeet that we are very, very fortunate to have at Kissimmee Prairie right outside of our office. Now this statue, um, we're looking at the back of the statue and she is kind of aimed to look up to the Northwest um, of the horizon and of the tree line. And the idea is that she is looking at Gum Slough, which is a photograph I showed you earlier of the Bottomland uh, Hardwood Swamp. And it's indicated on this map here. Um, you see the text in the northwest side of the map, and that's Gum Slough, which is the last nesting area in the wild of the Carolina parakeet and where Doe had collected those eggs. Um, or in the area where Doe had collected the eggs. And so Caroline is her name, Carolina, Caroline, the Carolina parakeet. Uh, she is looking towards her last known nesting location. It's a very touching, moving um, statue. I highly recommend you come and spend some time with Caroline anytime that you're here. It is important to note that this statue was placed in Kissimmee Prairie for the significance, not only of the Carolina parakeet, but because the artist was moved by the story of the Florida grasshopper sparrow. Now the Florida grasshopper sparrow at the time that the Carolina parakeet was placed was forecasted to go extinct in about 2018 because of the decline, the numbers that they had been looking at, um, they expected uh, an extinction from the wild at that time. And so he was moved by that and he wanted to place the statue, not only to commemorate the parakeet, but hopefully to be a good uh, a good memento and hopefully uh, avoid the extinction of the Florida grasshopper sparrow. Um, so yeah, we'll segue into Florida grasshopper sparrow, um, the, the story. So on the right is the graphic um, showing the decline of population of Florida grasshopper sparrow across four monitored grasshopper sparrow sites. Um, you can see in the early 2000s, most of these sites were starting to see a decline, unfortunately. And um, that was about the time that we started making some efforts to get together, coordinate uh, survey efforts, all these sort of things and figure out how do we keep this bird from going extinct? In 2017, there were less than 80 
individuals left in the wild. It was really dire, really dire. So it didn't go extinct necessarily in 2018, but it was pretty close. Um, in the left-hand side is a map of uh, central Florida. All the dark gray shaded areas are historic extents of Florida dry prairie. Any black outlined area are now conservation lands. And all the areas north of Okeechobee are where um, current extant populations of Florida grasshopper sparrow exist, including Kissimmee Prairie. Now, they didn't go extinct, but there's a reason for that. <laughs> we have done a lot of effort to uh, survey for and search for nests and protect nests since 2017 to help with the recovery of wild populations of the Florida grasshopper sparrow. We've also done a lot of uh, work in the captive breeding department so an initiative to breed sparrows in captivity and release them to the wild was initiated and we've gotten some really good success since then. So what does it take to find a Florida grasshopper sparrow? It usually takes a lot, unfortunately. We have a lot of property and a lot of survey points to cover in order to find Florida grasshopper sparrows and to find their nests. But that means we hire people every year to go out and search almost every square inch of this place to find them. And we capture birds, we capture adults, we ban them, we banned nestlings, who's what is in the middle. Um, that little guy was feisty um, and, and hungry, I guess. Uh, but yeah, we use colored bands to mark individuals, to monitor them over time, to know who we're working with, um, to of course gauge uh, some demography and age structure. It's a very beneficial way for us to have it. So. Uh, rule of thumb, if you see a grasshopper sparrow banded, it's very likely a Florida grasshopper sparrow. Um, and we can usually tell you who is who if you get the full band combo off of them. So we do find nests. It is in one of our uh, action um, goals to find and protect nests to increase nest success. Um, and we do that in a few different ways. On the left-hand side, you see a setup for uh, boiling water in the field. Um, and this seems a little silly, uh, but this is our approved method of treating red imported fire ants, which is one of the main uh, non-native nest predators of Florida grasshopper sparrows. So we use boiling hot water to kill mounds of fire ants. It usually targets the queen and many of the eggs. And after that, the um, mound dies off. And we've seen a pretty good success rate with this. Um, it is slow and cumbersome sometimes, but it is effective. Um, and it helps us protect and make sure that no fire ants are getting to the nestlings when they hatch. On the right hand side is a predator deflection fence that we will place around every single Florida grasshopper sparrow nest. <coughs> This nest, or this fence, I'm sorry, uh, deflects any sort of mammalian predators. So usually uh, spotted and striped skunks are the most common predators, nest predators uh, for Florida grasshopper sparrows. And this fence does a really good job at keeping them out. It doesn't do so great at keeping snakes out, unfortunately, but there is a fair balance of trying to find a way to protect the nests, but also not impede the adult's ability to get back to the nest. Um, so we do increase nest success with these methods. Um, however, it's not 100%. Um, so we do still lose uh, about 50% of the nest each year to varying reasons. Um, and although that doesn't sound like a lot, it is an, an improvement from uh, non-fence nests. And we have published data to support um, our efforts here. So I mentioned the captive breeding program. It has been wildly successful. This is a photograph of a female that was uh, released in the wild in 2020. And she was at Kissimmee Prairie this year and she had two successful nests. She was a great mom. Um, and it's a really cool way to see, you know, movement of these birds across the landscape, how much they are successful. They are breeding with wild birds um, and successfully producing offspring into the wild. So that captive breeding program has just done so much for us in then turning uh, numbers around for the Florida grasshopper sparrows. It's really great. Um, and what we got to celebrate this year was um, our 500th captive bred Florida grasshopper sparrow release. So now we are at over 500 Florida grasshopper sparrows released from that captive breeding program. 
Um, and it's so, so important um, for the recovery of this species. And we're all just so happy um, and grateful that this program has been successful. In addition to that, uh, we're still working hard on the ground to make sure we're finding nests and finding adults. We've had over 200 adults detected in 2022 over uh, 130 nests found and over 220 fledglings produced from those nests. So some really great numbers um, from this season and uh, it's all just, it's all good stuff. Uh, we're working really, really hard and we will continue finding nests, protecting nests and working to increase this population. So really fun uh, data from the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow Project. So I'm sure you're wondering, how do I get to see a Florida grasshopper sparrow? Well, this picture here on the right is probably what you're going to see a lot. These birds love to perch super low on the ground. And actually, a lot of times they spend more time on the ground than anything. Um, so they are very challenging to see in the field. However, I'll give you a couple of tips to hopefully help you out. This is, again, a map of Kissimmee Prairie. Um, that red line from the yellow star to the purple star is our main park drive. Um, and you can see it goes right through some dark red spots. All of these spots on the map are point count surveys. So everywhere we do surveys for Florida grasshopper sparrows. And the darker the red, the color, the more grasshopper sparrows we've detected at those points since 1998. The lighter the color, the fewer Florida grasshopper sparrows we've detected. So here's a tip. You sometimes are lucky enough to not even have to get out of your vehicle to see and hear a Florida grasshopper sparrow. Um, it can be that easy. Uh, it's not always that easy. Like I said, for even our sparrow techs, it takes a lot of effort um, to go into the prairie, find these birds, protect these birds. Uh, we do not like for people uh, walking into the prairie during breeding season. So April to August, please don't walk out into the prairie. Um, but like I said, sometimes you get really lucky just being on the park road and seeing grasshopper sparrows. Next tip I can give you is make sure you're looking at a grasshopper sparrow. There is an adult grasshopper sparrow on the left um, of the left uh, cluster of photos. And there's a Bachman sparrow, which many people can confuse them for. These are all little brown jobs. Sparrows are sometimes really, really challenging. Um, especially in the field when you only see them for a split second and it's terrible lighting and it's foggy and all those sort of things. However, just look for a few things. Does it have a short tail? The difference between the tail length is pretty significant when you're looking at a Bachman's versus a grasshopper sparrow. Um, grasshopper sparrows also typically are described to have a pretty flat head and a pretty big bill, um, but sometimes the Bachman's can look pretty flat. Um, at least their head, and so it's not always reliable. Grasshopper sparrows have a lot more creamy or buffy coloration on their cheek and their central median crown stripe. Um, they have that little bit of orange yellow above the eye and on their shoulder, whereas the Bachmans are pretty drab overall. They're a lot more gray and brown. Um, they're not as buffy and contrasty as grasshopper sparrows. Um, if you look on the right panel of photos, there is a comparison of the pretensis subspecies, which is the eastern migratory subspecies that we see in the winter months at Kissimmee Prairie, versus the Florida subspecies, which is on that bottom photo. And so there's some pretty unique differences. Um, however, consider that there are going to be overlaps, and in the field, sometimes it's harder to pick these things out um, versus when they're in the hand and sitting still for you like these photos. So um, just consider that. But yes, the pretensis, the eastern migratory uh, subspecies, typically isn't as, I'm going to keep using the word contrasty. I know that's not the greatest word. Um, but their um, coloration, they have a lot more rust in their uh, feathers, their um, covert feathers. Um, they're a little bit more just rusty and buffy overall. Um, whereas the Floridanus, they have a lot more black and dark in their coverts and a lot of their uh, feathers, body feathers on are like on the top of their head. And their cheek and their crown stipe, stripe usually stand out quite a bit as well as that uh, yellow on their shoulder and above their eye. Um, again, there's a lot of overlap. I'm gonna show you these photos. It's not always super easy 
<laughs> to tell them apart because pretenses still, can still have quite a bit of yellow. They can still be kind of contrasty. Um, and even the Floridas can have a lot of rusty. There is, you know, it is a subspecies. There is some genetic relatedness and overlap in just about everything. So um, definitely consider that when you're looking at birds um, in the field, it, it can still be hard. I don't always rely on photographs uh, to be able to make a definite yes or no. Uh, that's a Florida grasshopper sparrow. Uh, usually what I use, is it banded? Because that, that for sure can tell me, yes, it's a Florida grasshopper sparrow because it's a bird that uh, we've been monitoring. So it's hard. I'm, I, I know that that didn't answer any questions, I'm sure, but. <laughs> All right, so Florida grasshopper sparrows, all of the birds I've talked about today appreciate our habitat management. So like I said, historically, ecologically, this landscape requires frequent fire and flooding. It's important for us to maintain that. And when we do for that is using prescribed fire where we actually go out, intentionally light the landscape and burn it in very strategic and um, specific ways. So we actually use the term prescribed fire because we have a prescription. We have everything set up and planned in place to make sure that we're doing everything the right way, the safe way, and the best way for an ecological um, response, like having grasshopper sparrows nest there. We also do invasive plant management. Unfortunately, there's a lot of exotic or non-native plants that are in the area that can take over the uh, the prairie and some of our other ecosystems. So that's a big part of what we do here as far as habitat management. One of the other reasons why we have such great birds, I think, is because we are an international dark sky place. And it's not because we have that certification. It's just the fact that we have incredibly dark skies here. Um, it is an important thing and one of my favorite things that the International Dark Sky Association, the IDA, uses all the time. I'm looking at my bumper sticker over here on my board. Every day needs a night. It's so important for so many physiological reasons for all sorts of biota, um, having circadian rhythms that require a nighttime to reset and prepare for the next day. Obviously, stars are important for navigation, for migratory songbirds. Um, having a certain sunrise time initiates certain uh, hormone cycles. There's just so much that goes into it. Um, with across the United States, of course, we see lots of um, development and lots of light pollution, which is what this map indicates. The hot spots are these deep red colors, and even those white colors are the hottest and the brightest. Um, so this is the map of the United States. If you zoom into Florida, that little pocket of blue, which isn't the darkest sky ever, you can see stuff in the panhandle, um, even darker, and obviously the ocean's darker. Um, it is important that Kissimmee Prairie is a dark sky place and that we are um, protecting uh, from light pollution around us. So as I segue into the end of my presentation, I think I'm on time. Uh, I will promote our Friends of Kissimmee Prairie Preserve. Again, that slogan, where the rare is commonplace. It's so true. It's uh, really the, the namesake of this place. Uh, we just have so many cool rarities here. Um, I recommend joining and or donating. They do all sorts of fun events like butterfly and wildflower walks. Um, you can visit them on their website or on Facebook. Um, and yeah, I'll just say come visit. We've got over 120 miles of trail. Um, we've got three different campgrounds, uh, open 8 a.m. to sunset 365 days a year. You can't really, uh, <laughs> can't uh, have any excuses. We're open all the time. Come visit us. We have swamp buggy tours from November to March. Uh, we do special tours like the Orange Audubon field trip in April. Um, and there's just all sorts of opportunities for you guys to come out. I'm gonna highlight three of my favorite places to go birding in the park. Uh, the first one is the Peavine Trail up to the Willows. So it's kind of a unique area that most people don't go to, but if you park at the corner of our park road, which is a little weird, but when you go down our park road, it makes a sharp left-hand turn. There's a place to park there. You hike a little over a mile north 
and there's a really great spot for migratory songbirds. You're also walking by a bunch of wetlands um, and you can see shorebirds and wading birds and it's just a really cool hike and it's just a one a little over a mile out and back. The Prairie Loop Trail is the other one. So if you park at the trailhead and equestrian campground, it's a five mile loop and you go through multiple habitats. So it's great for sparrows, migratory songbirds. This is also the area where we see whitetail kites a lot. Um, and so probably one of your best places for whitetail kites in, um, in the breeding months for them. The Hammock Loop Trail is a shorter one mile loop through a music hammock in the family campground, our really nice historic hammock. And during the migration months, it is super great for neotropical migrants. Um, I highly recommend uh, coming out to any of those three places. And like I said, just birding from the road is actually really incredible sometimes. You are driving through some of the best prairie that we have. Um, and some of the hot spots for Florida grasshopper sparrows. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, tomorrow is our CBC. It's our second annual CBC at Kissimmee Prairie. We actually, the circle includes the DeLuca Preserve as well, which this map kind of cuts off, but I'm just talking about Kissimmee Prairie today. So um, we have over 30 volunteers, I think. And if you're interested and have nothing to do tomorrow, you wanna wake up early, call me and we'll we'll organize a team for you to join. Um, if not, keep us in mind for next year. Uh, we typically go for the first Friday of the CBC season, um, but that's not always a guarantee, but it's, I think, where we're leaning. Anyway, last year we had 106 total species, 90 of those were at KP um, and 84 were at DeLuca. Um, some highlights include our vermilion flycatcher who had been overwintering for a few years, whitetail kite, of course, a hairy woodpecker that was up at Deluca. Um, we had 25 northern pintails in one of our sloughs and over 14,000 tree swallows, which, you know, everyone sees lots of tree swallows, right? So nothing too crazy, but the number was impressive. So definitely consider us for CBC. If you're interested in joining us, uh, shoot me an email or call the park and we can add you. And with that, I will say thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Of course. Add us back to the stream. Okay. Uh, and we'll see what questions we've, we've already got in the comments. Okay. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. All right. I was going to ask about the uh, migratory um, grasshopper sparrow. Do you get them there as well and you have to distinguish or, or not really? We do. Yeah. So actually in the, the month of April is when my sparrow techs first come on board and we're training them to do sparrow surveys. And it is something that I spend a lot of time with them, um, teaching them the differences. Um, and it is, we use mostly behavioral cues because those plumage variations are, there's a lot of overlap. And, and when you're, when you've got a lot of survey points to do, you don't want to waste too much time following an Eastern. So there are definitely some, some things where we spend time like, okay, let's, let's learn the behavior of Florida grasshopper sparrows because that's going to give you more information and more of a definitive answer than those plumage um, variations. So yeah, in April is definitely a tricky time uh, for us to differentiate um, because we do get quite a few uh, of the Easterns here um, and lots of other cool sparrows. It's when we start hearing uh, even um, Henslows and Lacantes, like we'll hear other birds starting to sing too. And it's really interesting because they're obviously not on their breeding territory. Um, they're, they're just, everyone's getting excited for spring and, and start singing early. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, and are there a difference in the call song of the uh, regular grass? Totally. Yeah. So it's um, what I try to tell all my technicians, it's kind of a, a call rate. So the four, the grasshopper sparrow, they all do kind of that tick, tick buzz um, call. And so the buzz call, depending on, you know, which species you're listening to, it, it has some variations in, in the quality of it, 
Um, the Florida Grasshopper Sparrow is pretty consistent. If it's on territory and defending, he is going to sing about, he's going to do five buzzes per minute. So if you time it and it's like a pretty uh, normal pace in that buzzing, um, it's probably a Florida Grasshopper Sparrow. If it's a bird that sings once, one minute, and then like three minutes later, it sings like 10 times really fast. That's an Eastern who isn't quite on territory yet. And he's still trying to figure it out. I don't actually know what Easterns sound like on their actual breeding territory. Maybe they do sing faster. I don't actually know that. Um, but at least here, if they're kind of inconsistent in their frequency of buzzes or their rate of buzzes, um, we usually use that as a, an indicator that that's not a Florida grasshopper sparrow on territory. Um, so yeah, we do use song pretty, pretty heavily, um, when they are singing. Okay. I'm not sure if it's technology or just you <laughs> answered everything. Yeah, I answered everything. <laughs> um, I wonder if we can share your email address. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, is there a way for me? Uh, to I can write it out if you write it, read it off to me again. Okay, it is a lengthy one. So my full name, Catherine Welch, it'll be C-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E dot Welch, W-E-L-C-H at Florida, D-E-P dot G-O-V. Catherine.Welch at, what was the last thing? Uh, Florida, D-E-P dot G-O-V. Okay, let's see. Um, does that look right? Yeah, and the only correction is my, I instead of an E, I have a second A. So C-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E. Okay. I, I have an unusual spelling. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. Just one second. Um, and someone has just texted me to say that the chat is disabled. So, folks, I'm sorry. Um, but if you have some specific questions for her, um, you can uh, do that. And how am I going to change this? I'm having a little trouble. I'm going to go put it under banners, um, create a banner. Okay. The Ren, um, that Welch, let me still not have this right, but let me try it. Um, yes, I'm sorry if the uh, chat is disabled, uh, but everybody, you can, um, does that look right? No. Uh, Yes, not, you've added an S between Florida and DEP. You're almost okay. there. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, I can fix that. Um, but you spelled my name right, so thank you. <laughs> okay. It's kind of a nice spelling. All right, well, um, uh, okay. just email her if you have a specific question, and I'll put up again when our trip is. Um, this is one of our limited edition field trips, uh, $12 for members, $17 for non-members, just a day trip. And she has it set up with an eco buggy. Uh, so eight people can go on that, correct? And, correct. Uh, and while eight, eight people uh, do the hike and then swap. So 16 people maximum. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, I love this place and I'm looking forward to getting a ride out into the area. Particularly, I want to see the white tailed kites. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and the buggy, I recommend, like, even if you're coming on your off time, the, the Swamp Buggy rides are um, limited from November to March. However, they do get you, like, way out in the prairie, places that you probably wouldn't normally hike to, um, probably too far for you to hike. Like I said, it's 58,000 acres. It's a lot of property to see. And the Swamp Buggy really gives you uh, the opportunity to see that. So I'm really glad we get to do a special trip for you guys. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in, in April. All right. Well, I'll let everybody go. And uh, thank you again, uh, Katie. It was really, really nice. Thank you so much, Deborah. Have a great evening. Okay.